Jason and Phil and Bob because as you can tell, I'm a little technology uh, challenge, so to speak. I can't even say the word, but yeah, they keep me going. So we had some malfunction this morning and those guys make sure that this sort of keeps running so that we're able to use this and I appreciate them for doing that. This book, the Bible, Abraham Lincoln said, is God's greatest gift to man. Ulysses S. Grant, the 18th president, after him said of the Bible that this is the anchor to all of Americans' liberty. Hold fast to it. Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of these United States, said this. When asked about the Bible, he said, sir, that book is the rock on which all of our republic rests. And Ronald Reagan, his commentary on the Bible was simply that the Bible, that book, the Bible, it is the book that has all of the answers to all of man's troubles. Now, you just hear some of those statements from individuals that have once been in charge in this country or occupied the office of commander in chief, and it's not difficult to see that times have definitely changed. Now, you may not agree with everything those men stood for and believed. I don't believe that I do, but you can definitely see that there was a time in our country when individuals thought something about God's word, the Bible, and those times seem to have changed. Christians aren't in the majority. Our culture is no longer friendly to religion and its doctrines or beliefs. And where does that leave the Christians? You know, Jesus wasn't caught off guard by the idea that individuals wouldn't agree with his followers. In John 16 and verse 33, Jesus said, These things have I spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus knew that persecution would come to Christians and he prepared his disciples for these things. The church enjoyed the favor of its audience for a time. You know, in Acts 2, when the church began in verse 47, it says, praising God and having favor with all the people. There was a time when the church was favored, but it didn't last long, and persecution began. And since then, the church has been in this conflict with her culture. There's been this wrestling of those that don't agree with what we teach and practice and those that would try to silence religion and those that would simply try to muzzle the New Testament. So what are we going to do? You say, this is a new America. This isn't what some of you grew up with. You say, times have changed. What is the church to do? Are we simply to fold up our Bibles, you know, take ball and go home, right? We just don't know what to do. Vincent Van Gogh was right when he said, fishermen know the danger of the seas and they know the terrible nature of the storm. But they have never found these things a sufficient reason to remain ashore. They know all of these things may befall them as they go out into the sea, but yet they never look at all of the possibilities for failure and for destruction as a reason why they don't need to press forward. When you start reading in the New Testament, there are individuals that were in similar times to us, and I would beg to say some in worse conditions. And what does the New Testament say to the church and our culture? There's this clash, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, Christianity and ungodly culture. And how do the Christians respond? What do we do? How far do we go, and when do we throw in the towel? If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1, and we're going to get all of our points tonight from the book of Titus. It divides itself in three phases. And Paul wrote to young Titus, a preacher friend of his, and I want to let you in on some of the cultural things going on. So in Titus chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul's writing to young Titus, and he says, Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause I left you in Crete, that you might set in order the things that are wanting and appoint elders in every city as I appointed or as I commanded you. Paul left Titus in Crete. He says, I'm leaving you there because there are some things going on in the church and I want you to set in order some things that are lacking. Paul couldn't be everywhere all of the time and so he had individuals trained and Titus is one of those individuals and he says, I want you to stay in Crete and I want you to set up the church. What kind of place is Crete? Look at verse 12. Paul says one of themselves, even one of their own poets say that the Cretans, they're always liars, slow bellies, evil beasts. And then in verse 13, but this witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them that they rebuke them sharply that they might be sound in the faith. What kind of culture do you have in Crete? Paul says even one of their own poets testifies to the fact that they're always liars. The Cretans' line was proverbial. Everybody knew that the Cretans were liars. To lie in the first century was synonymous with being a Cretan. Nobody wrestled with that. They were shyest in business. If you wanted to out-trick a trickster, it was called simply playing the Crete with the Cretan. They were famous for their pottery. They had a great navy. 
These individuals were famous for their wine, so drunkenness often prevailed in their society. I'm telling you that first century Crete was not very different from modern day America. They were ungodly. There was a practice in first century Crete known as pederasty. Pederasty. And basically what would take place is this individual, if he was a king, a dignitary, or maybe just a common man, he would arrange for his own son to be kidnapped. And to be taken into the woods, and there, there would be other men there, and they would get to know his son. I'm telling you that first century Crete, it's hard to be a Christian in Crete. But God says to Titus through Paul, I'm sending you to Crete. There's some problems in the church there, Titus, and the Christians in Crete, they need to be instructed about some things. You can't just bail and go home, because Titus, you still have a responsibility. Now, you look at that culture in first century Crete, and then you look at America, and don't you see the parallels? There's the LGBT movement, and it seems to us like this is a new thing, but according to the first century, it's not very new. There's the evolution and the no-God argument that sweeps our culture and our schools that says, you just got here by accident by a universe that never had you in mind in the first place. Morality is laughable. But here we are assembled in the name of our God. Now, how do we respond to a culture like that? How do we raise our children? How do our families look in a culture like Crete? And so God gives us, by inspiration, the book of Titus. Here is one of their temples, one of their palaces. This is called the Kenosis Palace. It's still, it's restructured. It stands today in Crete. This is where a lot of their idolatry took place, a lot of their business, a lot of their art. They were famous for their pottery and things like that. The island of Crete today sustains itself by the visiting of tourists. A lot of beaches in Crete today. Over three million tourists go through there each year, and that's how they sustain. But Paul wrote to Titus in the first century, and he says, the town of Crete is in trouble. The church is there, and there's some things you need to set in order. I want us to look at three phases, because the book divides itself rather easily. Ch chapter 1, he says some things to the church. Chapter 2, he says some things to the Christian home. And then in chapter 3, he talks about our interaction with outsiders. And I want to look at you tonight with the book of Titus, or look with you at the book of Titus, and let's just see what it says to us and about how we need to respond to the culture in which we live based on what the New Testament teaches. Number one, he says, I want the church to remain distinctive. So he says, though you're in Crete, there are some things in Titus chapter 1 that he's going to say, you can't get let off the hook as a Christian. Look at Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. Number one, Titus, don't forget about eternal life. And though you live amongst the people where lying is like their second language, God cannot lie. And he promised you eternal life. You think Christians in Crete need to remember this. It's easy to get caught up in all of the hustle and bustle that surrounded them and just quit. Paul says, this world really is not your home. And if you're going to live in an ungodly culture, it's going to be very important that you remember that you are just a visitor. You're not here permanently. You're just visiting temporarily. And though you're in Crete, and though ungodliness seems to run rampant, Titus, don't you forget that there's an eternal life that's just beyond this one. And I need you to stay faithful. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Look what Peter says to the Christians there that he calls pilgrims in verse 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Peter says... There's an inheritance. It's reserved in heaven for you. It's incorruptible, undefiled. It fades not away. Even though you're in this culture, don't get comfortable here. I think it was two weeks ago now we went on the last Toledo's convention trip to Orlando. And there, there's a, you stay in a hotel. I don't know, many of you have no doubt stayed in hotels. Anybody ever bring all their stuff from home when you go to a hotel? You ever bring a U-Haul, you just load all your stuff? Somebody says, no, that would be silly. I mean, you go in there, you start taking out the pictures, and you just rearrange it with your own furniture, and you just move in. I'm only going to be here a short while. Why would I do Why get comfortable? Sometimes in my ungodly culture, I'm getting comfortable. I'm moving all my stuff in. I'm setting down the stakes like, this is home. I really like it here. One man said, too many times I find myself shining the furniture on the Titanic. 
I know this is going down, and I know this is true, but I really like it here. This is looking a lot more like home than the place that Peter says is incorruptible and undefiled, that fades not away. First thing he says to Titus in chapter 1 is, I want you to remember about eternal life. Number two, look at verse 3. He says, but has in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Number two, if the church is going to remain distinct, the preaching has to be sound. He says, God has made himself known or manifest through preaching, this communication. In an ungodly culture, it's going to be important that the preaching is distinct, that the preaching is sound. Lost people shouldn't walk into our assemblies and walk out and never know the difference. Now, we're going to talk about more about later on in this sermon. How does that look? How do you engage those individuals? But I simply mean to say our preaching in an ungodly culture needs to be a lot different. Because in a time like this, churches are popping up everywhere. Different people are having different views about, well, maybe the Bible doesn't mean what it says. Paul says God has manifested himself or made himself known or clear. And one of the avenues, the avenue he chose to do that with is through preaching. And in the pew, I have a responsibility to hold the man that stands before me to the standard of the New Testament, Titus, remember this and remember that the church must remain distinctive. Paul says, you know, that preaching the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us which are saved, it is the power of God. It's written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Titus, remember that preaching, it needs to be sound. The last one from this chapter is in verse 5. The church needs to remain distinct. How does she do it? For this cause I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed you. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, nor striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. What's the church look like in ungodly culture? Number one, remember eternal life. Number two, sound preaching. Number three, he says, she can't be left to herself. You need sound men in the eldership. He lists some qualities here, and he says, you need to make sure that there are elders in the church there because there's trouble. And if the sheep are simply left to themselves, trouble's going to get worse. Now, imagine the culture we described in Crete, and then Paul lays down these heavy qualifications as if to say, it doesn't matter how ungodly the culture gets, you can't compromise these qualities. You can't say, well, he's got three out of the ten. We're, we're going to have to go with him. We can't wait until, well, you know, we don't. It's too late now to get anybody, so I guess we're just going to have to go with him. He'll grow into it. Paul says he needs to have these qualities. He needs to possess these things. Look at Acts chapter 20. Look at Acts 20, and look what Paul says to the elders from Ephesus on the island of Miletus. This is his last time speaking with these men face to face. And he gives, some, he gives some advice to them as elders. And he warns them about their role. Acts chapter 20 and look at verse 28. Paul says, Take heed unto yourself and to over all the flock of God, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He says, for this I know, after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Paul says, I want you elders to be on guard because I know that after my departure, there are going to be some individuals with false motives. So many times when churches go astray, men say, what school did the preacher go to? What did he, what did, what did he teach? In Acts 20, Paul says, the buck stops with who? Stops with the eldership. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 13, Paul says, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. I don't know how much you travel. I don't know how much of the church you've seen in America, but when you get the chance, you ought to walk up to the elders that shepherd this flock and hug their neck. Now, I'm not going to tell you that these men are perfect, that they're sinless, but I'm telling you that there are some places that aren't as privileged as we are. There are some places where there is no real leadership, and Paul says when you have it, 
you esteem them very, very highly in love for their work's sake. Not going to make all the decisions that you would like, but in ungodly creep, the first thing Paul says is, I want you to make sure that you set the elders up there, and I want those individuals to meet these qualifications. 1 Peter chapter 5, let's look at that passage, and then we'll move on to chapter 2 of Titus. 1 Peter 5, and he gives more advice to elders, and Peter is also an elder. 1 Peter 5, and we'll start in verse 1. Peter, writing to elders, says, The elders which are among you I exhort. I encourage them. He says, I'm also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and a partaker of the glory which shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof, he says, not of constraint, but willingly, not of filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Not as being lords over God's heritage or flock, but as in samples to the flock. Peter says, when you look around your congregation, I want you to look at those elders and be able to say, now, that's a real man. You just be an example to the flock. He says, this is how you are to lead these individuals. They can look at your life and say, it's exemplary. I want to be like him when I grow. I want to be an elder. Titus, make sure that you set up elders in the church at Crete. They're in trouble. They're in an ungodly culture. And without the proper leadership, the church will go by the wayside. Why does he need to do this? Look at Titus chapter 1. And we're going to move right into chapter 2. Look at Titus 1. So in verse 12 through 13, he talks about their behavior, and he says they're always liars, they're evil beasts. Verse 14, we need these things in place because they're Jewish fables. They're false doctrines that are permeating the church. Verse 15, some individuals' conscience are defiled. And he says some people's minds are just so seared that they can't change. And then in verse 16, they're imposters. There are some that profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. And as far as good works are concerned, they're disobedient. In an ungodly culture, how do we respond? First thing we need to do. I mean, it's easy to look at the world, watch Fox and CNN, and say, our world has gone crazy. Paul's, the first thing Paul deals with, you take care of home. This world has a strange habit of always acting like the world, you know. They just always behave just exactly like the world. But the church, he says, I want you to be different. Remember about eternal life. Don't you forget it. Make sure that the preaching is distinct. You set up elders in their place. Ch Titus chapter 2. Holiness in the home. Look at ch Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. But speak the things which become or which adorn sound doctrine. Now sometimes we, we talk about this word sound a lot. Is he a sound preacher? Is that a sound church or congregation? And rightfully so. But that word sound just simply means healthy. And Paul says, I want you to speak the things that are healthy for the church and he's going to talk about the home. Paul's going to start laying down some things. When Paul talks about sound doctrine in the book of Titus, he talks about the home. Now that word sound, when you look it up in your New Testament, it seems to be unique only to the Apostle Paul. He's the only one that uses that word. After ch chapter 1, now he talks about how the home should look. And he's going to go step by step to each individual in the home situation and say, in Crete, this is how I want you to be. Go a little out of order first and say something about homes. Weak homes always make weak churches. Somebody says, I want a strong congregation. What you really mean to say is simply, I want strong homes. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that I have a strong home? Whose responsibility is it to train up my children? The elders no doubt oversee this flock and the preachers will preach and the Bible class teachers will do that. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that my home, that the children that leave my home they grow up sound in the faith. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he what? He won't depart. Ephesians 6 and 4, he says that, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What would the government do if you only fed your child two times a week? What would they do? Somebody says, can you say DCF, right? Right. Somebody says, that won't work. My children eat two times an hour, right? <laughs> Why would I ever think that spiritually that'll work? Well, they come Sunday and Wednesday. I mean, they're getting it there, right? I mean, they're here when the doors are open, and I send them to camp sometimes. That ought to be enough for them. They're in lads. He says, I want you to have sound doctrine, and part of that is in the rearing of children. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and look at what Moses says by inspiration 
to those under the old law and what I think he says to us by extension concerning the New Testament. Verse 6, he says, And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and you will bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you will write them on the post of your house and on your gates. Moses seems to say that there's never going to be a time when I'm not teaching. When they sit down, when they rise up, when they lay down, when they walk by the way, Moses says, I want you to take over the spiritual education of your children and don't you leave that responsibility to anybody else. That means I won't ever let my children come to the assembly without one of these, right? I'm just not going to do it. I mean, would you let them go to school without a book bag? And I don't mean to be rude or unkind. I just simply want to encourage us that we're in an ungodly culture. And for every virtue that we won't teach our children, there's a vice that the world is waiting to interject. I won't let my children walk out of the house without one of these on a Sunday or Wednesday. I heard Brother McAnally on the radio program a few weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, and I was running through some of the old ones, and he was doing a one-minute segment on the home, and it was a story he told about a young girl, and she said, her mom came to the young girl, and she said, well, mom, I want you, mom says, I want to read the Bible together. Come on, you're going to sit down, and you're going to read my Bible. And the girl insists, let's read grandmother's Bible. I want to read grandmother's Bible. And she says, no, I want you to read mine's. And me and grandmother have the same Bible. She says, no, evidently grandmother's Bible is a lot more interesting than yours because she seems to read hers a lot more frequently than you do. I'm going to set the example in my home. One poet said, you know, I saw tomorrow look at me through little children's eyes. And I thought how careful we would teach if we were really wise. And you just think about that. Somebody says, they're the church of the future. No. If they've been baptized for the remission of sins, they're the church of today. What else does he say concerning the home? Look at Titus chapter 2. Roles of men and women. Verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and in patience. Paul says, if I'm a man in the church, there are certain things that I need to be. And a part of that is I need to be sound in faith. Now, in chapter 1, he deals with elders. Maybe you want to be an elder. He says, if you are, you need these qualifications. But in chapter 2, verse 2, it really matters not whether I'm an elder. Now he's talking just to the average Christian man. And he says to him, you need to be sound in faith. You need to study the Bible. You need to know what it teaches. You need to be an example. Paul would say to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the words you've heard of me among many witnesses. The same you commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If I drop dead in this pulpit, somebody should be able to come up with a Bible and just continue the lesson. You know, you just drag me out back and you just bury me and you just go on with the service, right? Sound in faith. Jim said amen. Well, we appreciate that. <laughs> but um, sound in faith. Jude verse 3 says, I want you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered for the saints. How am I going to do this if I don't know what this book teaches. Too many times we write ourselves a pass. He says, I want the men to lead in the home, but you got to start spiritually. He says some things to the women. Look in verse 2, verse 3. That the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becomes holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their own husbands, to be discreet, chaste, Keepers at home, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. He says, I want the older women, I want you to adopt the younger women of the congregation. I want the older women to take the younger under their wings so that they don't have to look to Taylor Swift and Beyonce for role models. I want them to look at you. He says, I want you to teach them some things, some things they won't just learn on their own. Their own. There needs to be love for the husband, love their children. He says, discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Now, some have, I believe, butchered this verse to mean that the only thing that you can do is be a keeper or a maker of the home. I don't believe that's what Paul is teaching. But I think he is teaching that it really matters not what a role or a physical job is in the secular world. Her first priority is the home. It says women need to be taught that these younger women, they just won't catch this like they catch a cold. They need somebody to take them alongside and say, now this is how it's done. You're not going to get this overnight, but with work, this is how it's done. But look at verse 5. If this doesn't happen, the word of God will be blasphemed. That is, in an ungodly culture where the women aren't what they're supposed to be, don't be surprised when the Bible's spoken against. 
He says, if these things don't happen, the word of God may very well be blasphemed. And that should never be. Paul says to a culture in which women could hardly testify in court, they couldn't have rights that the men had, you still have a role. May not be in a public position of ministry, but somebody said, you know, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, right? Mamas make preachers, I heard once. Women, I want you to train those individuals so that they might be faithful. And then in verse 6, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. He says, in all things show yourself a pattern of good works. In doctrine show sincerity or uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Older men, you have a charge. Younger women and younger, older women and younger women, you have a charge. And then he starts talking to the young man. And out of all of the things that he says, it's impressive that to the young man in verse 6, he says, I just want you to focus on being sober-minded. I mean, if you could just keep a clear mind, young man, he says, you're in good shape. The lectureship this year, Brian had a youth section there on Monday, and he had different topics covered. And Forrest, who writes the paper with me, he had the danger of the Internet. And he talked about the youth that are in trouble through the different things that the Internet poses. And I looked at the lectureship book before I came tonight, and the statistics are very, they're very disturbing and alarming. And I know why now Titus says, I want the young man to be sober-minded. 93% of boys in America have viewed pornography by the time they're 18. 93%. I mean, that leaves very little room for any falseness about that. There's 93%. 68% have viewed the same thing with same-sex relations by the time they're 18. He says, but young man, I want you to be sober-minded. You've got to get a hold of your mind. There are a lot of things that are going to pull for your attention, but Titus... Make sure that the young men remember that this life isn't all there is. Don't let anybody despise your youth. Be an example to the believers in word and conversation, charity, purity. You might save other individuals by the example that you set. Look at the end of chapter 2. He says some things about grace, and then we'll move into chapter 3 and we'll quit. Why should I do all of these things? Why is there holiness needed in a home of ungodly culture? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Paul says when you think about grace, it motivates you to have the kind of home that you need. Grace instructs, grace prepares me for the world, grace tells me some things I need to deny, what do you say to an ungodly culture like Crete? In the first place, church, remain distinct. Don't compromise your qualities just because the culture around you is ungodly. Chapter 2, our home should look different. People should look at our marriages and say, now that's how it's done. People should look at our children and say, now that's how it's done. And then in chapter 3, he says something about how do we engage with outsiders. And this is where I think we have the most difficulty today. The church, I want you to be a certain way. At home, you have to be a certain way. Now, how does this relate in a world where everything about them pretty much hates everything that we stand for? What do I do about this? Look at chapter 3 of Titus. Look at verses 1 and 2. He says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Titus, I want you to make sure that you teach them to submit to government and leadership. In a time in which we live in a politically charged society, right? Anybody hear anything about an election coming up? Titus, I want you to put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. What does verse 2 say? That they speak evil of no man. And I would write in the margin of my Bible, even if it's true. Because I think we have a problem with that, right? I just, I mean, Hiram, you don't understand. Does he really mean what he says there? I mean, what if they promised me that my health care wasn't going to go up, but they, well, maybe I'm speaking of myself right now, but they made promises and they didn't come through. What if my taxes go up because of this government and it seems like all they want to do is take from me? You speak evil of no man. 
what if I think that Facebook post is really funny and I just want to share it? I mean, I think he's stupid. I, I don't want to vote for her. She's, see, the question boils down to, am I a Cretan or am I a Christian? Am I really from Crete, Titus would say, or are you in Christ? Because the Christians don't wallow in those types of things. Now, we're going to speak out against ungodliness and things that are wrong. That's just who we are. We're not going to go along with sin. But we will never think that for a moment we can take off our Christian armor. God didn't create politics so that we might be able during this time of the year to show people just how unchristian we really are. You know, when I stand up before people and say, I believe in the New Testament church, I believe there's only one way to get through to heaven. That's through Jesus Christ and through his church. I believe that baptism is for the remission of sins. When you start saying those things, you get some people pretty uncomfortable. I simply say that to say this. Got enough reasons why people have a problem with Christians already. Got enough reasons why people may not like us. Let's not add to it with things that have little or no significance. Just because it's my right, I'm going to say what I want. And the way to fix this is not to unfriend the preacher on Facebook. Really, it's your, look, it's your page. I can't stop you. But are you from Crete or are you in Christ? Look at Romans 13. Look what Paul says about our relationship to government. Because everything in our culture is going to say, if you get mad, you just throw a tantrum. If you don't like what they say or what they do, you just do whatever you want. And if anybody disagrees with you, well, you just let them have it. Paul says, just wait one minute. You're not from Crete. Your hope is in heaven. That's where your eternal life is. And the way that you engage with outsiders is going to be important. Romans 13, verse 1, Paul says, let every, subject be, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever, therefore, resist the power, resist the ordinance of God, and those that resist will receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. Will you then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you will have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to you for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. He's the minister of God to you, an avenger or a revenger to execute wrath on them that do evil. Paul says over and over again that the governmental structure, the individual in charge, God may not agree with everything he says, but he's God's servant and God's minister. God set up government, and God's going to deal with ungodly government. But as a Christian, what is my responsibility? In Crete, when I'm in an ungodly culture, how do I engage with these outsiders? I know you're going to get upset. I know you, I don't like it any more than you do, but how are you going to engage in this? In Matthew 12, Jesus said these words in verse 36 and 37. I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, every careless word that men shall speak, they will give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Before you get ready to type that post, before you get ready to just say that phrase in the break room or at the grocery store, just remember that there's going to come a day in which those words have sprinted ahead of you and they wait at the finish line of life at the judgment. You ready for that? You okay with your speech track record? Speak evil of no man, he says to Titus. Really doesn't matter if you get upset, doesn't matter if you don't agree, this is how I want you to behave. Why is that? Look at Titus chapter 3. Look at verse 4. Well, look at verse 3. He says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. How do I engage with outsiders, people that aren't Christians? How does this look on a daily basis? Paul says, you got to remember where you came from. Speak evil of no man. Why not, Paul? Because we used to be like that. I know the New Testament says a great deal about forgetting your past, and that's true. You obey the gospel, every sin's washed away, every one of them. But there is a healthy part of this where I need to remember where I've come from before I was in Christ. Now, for some of us, that window is a lot smaller than others. But one day out of Christ is just as bad as 20 years. And if I don't keep a good handle 
on what I used to be before I became a Christian. I mean, the things I used to say, the things I used to watch, the way that I used to carry on, it's going to really affect the way that I treat others. You've got to remember who's writing this. It's the Apostle Paul. You think he ever had nightmares about standing there and watching those rocks bounce off of Stephen until he just died? And Paul says, listen to me, I'm telling you, people can change. Paul says, I'm telling you, we used to be like those individuals, and we need to treat them properly because they can change. Sometimes Christians, we get upset and we say things Christians shouldn't say. If they let in those Syrian refugees, I'm just going to... And Paul's saying... Don't you know that the only reason why you're saved is because the love of God appeared? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. I think it's sometimes wise to sit back and just take time to evaluate how far God has brought us. And think about all that he's done for us and remember that the only thing that makes us better or the only thing that makes us in a different standing from the person on the street that you see, the worldly individual that's heading toward hell without Christ is the blood of Jesus. We are Christians that happen to live in America and not the other way around. How do I engage with outsiders in the last place? Look at verse 9. He says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Paul says some people just won't change their mind. And when you run into those people, be ready to reject them. Some people at your job are just going to try to start religious arguments just because they know what you believe. Some people at school are just going to tempt you and try to get you into these traps. And Paul says, you need to know what that's like. And when you see that after the second admonition, a person that just likes to get into controversy for controversy's sake, he says, don't let that influence you. There are other people that are ripe soil, individuals that really want the gospel, and don't waste all your time on the person with the hard heart. You're in Crete, Titus. What do you teach? They're ungodly. There's homosexuality going on. There's drunkenness. There's lying. There's theft. What do you teach? I want the church to remain distinct. I want the home to look like God would have it to look. And then in the last place, I want you to know how you ought to treat outsiders. Because people can change. In Acts chapter 2, there are a host of nations that are listed there. And there are all of these nations. But in Acts chapter 2 and verse 11, it says that there were individuals from Crete there and there were men from Arabia. And I can't help but to think that when the question was asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responds, repent and be baptized, every one of you. That some of those individuals that come from that Christian culture walked down that aisle and were baptized for the remission of sins. And you may see some of them in eternity and know them as brother and sister. Why? Because people can change. We're in a new America now. It's not the same. But the gospel is. Tonight, if you're outside of Christ, don't be swallowed by the culture. You can change. The New Testament says that Jesus died for every sinner and for every sin. And if you believe that he is the Christ, then you turn from sin and confess him and allow your body to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, he'll save you. The only thing that stands between a man and God is himself and his sins, and God has done everything possible to remove that barrier. And when all else failed, God said, I'll go myself. And he sent his son in the human flesh to die for your sins. If you stand subject to the Christian's prayers tonight, you want to be encouraged. You want to be restored. You can do that also. I want everybody tonight to just think about this lesson. And just think as you go out this week and you encounter those individuals, for lack of better words, that are Christians. How are you going to relate to them? How are you going to reach out to them? so that they might know that we have a hope that's beyond this world. If you stand subject, come now as together we stand and sing.